Welcome back to Combat Mission, where we're going to take a look at British infantry companies in Battle for Normandy and Fortress Italy. Their organisation, weapons, equipment, and of course their tactical utility. How to get the most out of them in-game and in the Force Selector. There are some minor differences between the British infantry in Normandy and Italy, which I'll go over, but nothing significant, and for the same reason the details in this video should apply to British rifle companies in Final Blitzkrieg when they make it in, and of course all of the factions following the British table of organisation and equipment, so the Canadians, New Zealanders, Poles, South Africans and Indians. Obviously you can't have a rifle company without rifles. The Brits in World War II are armed with the short magazine Lee Enfield, or SMLE. This is a bolt-action weapon firing .303 Mark VII ammunition from a 10-round magazine. The Pixel Trepan will fire it out to a maximum range of 500 meters, but realistically actually hitting a target at 500 meters through iron sights under battlefield conditions is pretty unlikely. Closer engagements are going to get you better results. There are two types of Lee Enfield modelled in combat mission. The number one Mark III star, which crops up in Fortress Italy for the earlier time periods and lower quality formations, and the number four Mark I star, which is present for later or higher quality formations in Italy and universally issued in Battle for Normandy. In short, the number four is the simplified mass production version of the number one, so there are no meaningful differences between them in game. If you really want to identify them, the number one Mark III has a very obvious rear sight block about halfway along and a flush muzzle, while the number four has its rear sight block just behind the breech and a muzzle that projects beyond the front sight. The main downside to the SMLE is the bolt action part. This translates into a low rate of fire, about 10 to 11 rounds a minute max for regular troops with no modifiers. And while this can be mitigated somewhat by massing rifles, it still feels very anemic, and relying purely on Lee Enfields to achieve fire superiority isn't going to end well. This was entirely understood by the British, which is why instead of building the infantry section around massed Lee Enfields, they built it around the Bren light machine gun. The Bren was based on the ZBVZ-26, and the name reflects the weapon's background, BR for Brno, the Czechoslovakian city where it was originally designed, and EN for the Royal Small Arms Factory at Enfield in London. It's a gas-operated weapon that can be fired single shot or fully automatic, feeding from the immediately identifiable 30-round magazine on top of the weapon. Like the Lee Enfields, the Bren fires .303 Mark VII British, so there's perfect ammunition compatibility between the rifleman and the LMG. In fact, checking the front of your average British rifleman in this period reveals two large pouches on the web gear. These are for carrying Bren magazines, so the entire rest of the section functions as ammo bearers for the machine gun. The Pixel Trippant will use the Bren out to slightly greater range than the Lee Enfield, out to about 750 meters if ordered, but the suppressive effect at that range is not going to be fantastic, it is just a light machine gun after all. In theory, the Bren works best with a number 2 who can take advantage of the top mounted magazine for fast reloads, it's much quicker for a second party to swap the mags like this than it is for the gunner to do it himself, plus the gunner doesn't lose his sight picture this way, but it doesn't look like this particular feature of the Bren is modelled in a combat mission, reloading takes about 8 seconds. Not that this makes a tremendous difference, if your firefights are resting on such a knife edge that a couple of extra seconds reloading is the difference between success and failure, something's probably gone wrong much earlier. In the infantry section, the Bren sits in its own team, the Bren or Gun Group, which consists of the Bren Gunner himself, a rifleman, and the section 2IC. There are seven more men in the section, split by default in combat mission into two teams, a three-man rifle team, including an anti-tank specialist, and a four-man element with three more riflemen and the section leader, who is armed with a submachine gun, either a Sten Mark II or a Thompson M1A1. The Sten is standard for Battle for Normandy, while the Thompson can be found in Fortress Italy in the same kinds of places as the number one Mark III in the Enfield for the same reason. Namely that the British forces operating in the Mediterranean had to be equipped off the shelf with what Britain already had or could buy, while the British army that went to Normandy had been equipped with the products of national mobilisation. The two weapons represent different design philosophies. The Thompson is a finely machined, very expensive commercial product, 
The Sten is an aggressive piece of plumbing that could be, and was, churned out in the millions as cheaply and quickly as possible to re-equip the British Army after the fall of France. The main differences in combat mission terms are that the Thompson uses 45 caliber ACP ammunition and the Sten uses 9mm, but seeing as though these are both incompatible with the rest of the section's weapons, that's basically irrelevant. And the Pixel Truffle will fire the Sten out to 200 meters, but the Thompson out to only 160. The effective range of either weapon is more like 100 meters, and preferably less, so again, it's not a meaningful difference here. The Sten has two extra rounds in the magazine with 32, while the Thompson has 30, but again, this is not a big deal. Finally, down at section level, the Bren Gunner also carries a .38-200 Webley Mark IV revolver. Pistols in combat mission are not tremendously useful, but for those who want to know, it uses .38 Mark II ammunition, has six shots, and if any of your pixel trippers actually have to use it, they've either been caught reloading the Bren or you're in serious trouble because you're out of rifle ammunition. Speaking of ammunition, the section carries a total of 1,570 rounds of .303 Mark VII, 160 rounds of 9mm for the Sten, or 150 rounds for the Thompson, and a whopping 18 rounds of .308 Mark II for the Webley. The section also carries a total of 18 hand grenades. These appear to be the number 36M Mark I Mills bomb, which is a fragmentation grenade, but it's not entirely clear whether there are some other grenades mixed in. Splitting off an anti-tank team produces a two-man team consisting of the section anti-tank specialist and a rifleman with 10 grenades between them, and they appear to be more effective at knocking out enemy tanks than, for example, a two-man scout team without the AT specialist. Whether this is because they simply have more grenades to use, because the anti-tank specialist can use grenades more effectively against enemy armor, or whether he's equipped with more specialized anti-tank grenades like Gamma Bombs or Hawkins Mines is unclear. It's potentially a combination of all three, although the grenades are all visually represented as milled bombs. That's the infantry section then. There are three of these in a rifle platoon plus the platoon HQ and a 2 inch mortar team, and the option to equip the first section with a peart. The platoon HQ consists of three men, the platoon leader, his assistant or executive officer, and a radio man. The platoon leader is armed with a pistol, either a Webley like the Bren Gunner or the much superior Browning High Power. The High Power is a 9mm semi-automatic with a 13 round magazine, making it much more useful than the Webley, but only in the way that throwing a brick is slightly better than throwing a rock. If the platoon leader is actually using his weapon, he is probably not doing platoon leader stuff, so something has gone wrong. Unfortunately, being armed only with a pistol makes him very easy to identify. Nothing screams I am important like a sidearm. On top of that, in combat mission he's modelled as a lieutenant, so he has two pips on his epaulets that you can check for if you're fighting the Brits and building your intel picture. The assistant is armed with a Sten gun or Thompson, depending on the theatre and formation quality, and the radio operator is armed with a Lee Enfield. Ammunition loadout varies somewhat depending on the weapons present, but it follows the standard loadouts for each weapon. The rifle has 110 rounds, the SMGs carry 5 magazines, and the pistols carry 4 reloads, with everybody carrying 2 hand grenades. Considerably more important than the ammo count for the platoon HQ is the presence of a radio and the platoon leader's binoculars. Given that the HQ really shouldn't be fighting, it should be spotting and communicating. Each platoon has a light mortar team armed with the Ordnance SBML 2 inch mortar. This uses 51mm ammunition and has a range of between 20 and 457 meters. It's a very simple weapon. The operator chucks a bomb in, then uses a trigger at the base to fire it. The small size makes it much easier to handle than other mortars. It comes in one piece so there's no separate base plate or bipod to carry around, and no need to deploy it, but it can only be used for direct fire. The mortar team consists of three men, two armed with rifles, and the mortar operator himself armed with a submachine gun, all with the standard ammunition loadouts. Ammunition load for the mortar itself is 12 high explosive bombs, 9 smoke bombs, and 9 white phosphorus bombs. This really highlights its intended role in smoking up enemy positions to allow the platoon to maneuver. After all, there's only so much high explosive you can fit into a 51mm bomb. That said, the 2 inch mortar is an accurate weapon and while the HE bomb is a little anemic compared to the other mortars, those 12 bombs are easily enough to take something out like an enemy machine gun nest. Finally, the platoon has the option of being equipped with a peart. 
This is the Projector Infantry Anti-Tank, which uses a combination of giant spring and a small charge on the rear of the projectile to fire an 83mm shaped charge warhead out to 160 meters. In other words, while the Americans and the Germans moved from the anti-tank rifle to anti-tank rockets with the bazooka and the Panzerschreck, the British went in, should we say, a different direction. The fact that rockets were universally adopted after World War II instead of spring-based spigot mortar type AT weapons should tell you everything. However, the Piat has some significant advantages over rocket-based weapons. There is no backblast, so firing it doesn't generate a quickly spotted cloud of smoke and dust, and there are no issues firing it in enclosed spaces. The projectile itself is much bigger than the 66mm bazooka and hence more effective when it hits the target, plus the lower projectile velocity and resulting arc in trajectory can lead to peer rounds striking the more vulnerable top armour of enemy tanks at longer ranges. It's capable of taking out Panzer IVs and lighter vehicles without too much trouble, though side skirts can pose problems to the shaped charge, and it can punch through the side and rear armour of Panthers and Tigers. It's not going to do much to these when firing at the front, unless the trajectory manages to get the bomb falling down onto the hull or turret top. A lot of the real world downsides to the Piat are also not really present in combat mission. It was heavy and awkward at about 15 kilograms, the bombs could fall out to the front if you were aiming it downwards, and the detonation of the propellant charge didn't always recock the spring, meaning the operator needed to exert a significant amount of effort to do so manually. But, like I say, we don't need to worry about that in combat mission, we just need to worry about the fact that you only have one Piat per platoon, and that a single Piat only comes with six rounds of ammunition. That's it for the individual platoon weapons. The company has three of these platoons, led by the Company HQ, which has a 2IC team and a sniper team attached. The Company HQ and 2IC follow the same line as the Platoon HQ. They're led by a pistol-wielding officer, a major or a captain respectively. The rank insignia on the pixel dropper doesn't look quite right to me, but anything on the epilepsy in general is good enough to say shoot me to anyone who takes a closer look. The HQ has three riflemen and a radio operator, also armed with a rifle, and the 2IC is backed up by another three riflemen. The sniper team consists of two pixel truppen, a team leader armed with a Lee Enfield, and a marksman equipped with a scoped variant, the number 4 Mark 1 T. The team carries a total of 160 rounds of .303 Mark 7. The important part in this team is the marksman designation, which means that the actual sniper in the sniper team has had extra training and is a better shot than the average non-marksman rifleman. The team also carries a pair of binoculars which are obviously useful, and their presence in the formation means that they're well placed in the hierarchy to share information with the company HQ, which can rapidly feed it down to the platoon leaders, provided you can get the C2 chain up and running. Finally, the rifle company actually comes in two flavours. So far we've been looking at the companies from the rifle battalion in the infantry branch, but there's also the lorried variant of the rifle battalion in the force selector which comes under armoured infantry. This basically puts the whole company on wheels. Each platoon is equipped with a truck containing another 4,000 rounds of 303, plus more ammunition for the 2-inch mortar, another 13 high explosive and 3 white phosphorus rounds for a mere extra 28 points. The platoon peart and its ammunition is also stored separately in the truck as an acquirable asset rather than it being automatically assigned to the first section, so you have some flexibility about who gets to carry it. Obviously, if you do bring the truck, don't ever let the enemy have the slightest chance of catching it full of infantry because you're practically guaranteed to lose the entire platoon in one go. The lorry battalion also includes a Bren carrier and Willis Jeep for the company HQ, both of which are equipped with radios, plus a slightly smaller truck with even more ammunition. These enhance the communications links and flexibility of the company, so it's worth going for if you're not restricted to infantry only. That then is the organisation, weapons and equipment of the British Rifle Company in combat mission. So how do we use it? Down at section level we have a pretty clear setup. A fire element with the Bren gun, then a two-part manoeuvre element with the rifles. So the C team, otherwise known as the Bren gun or gun group, suppresses the enemy while the A and B teams with the riflemen advance by fire and movement to close with the enemy. This is preferably done from the flank, taking full advantage of the terrain, and while it's more about gaining an effective close range firing position for the Lee Enfields, the section also carries plenty of hand grenades for close in work. Similarly, in the defence, the keystone is the Bren. 
which is best off on one flank to maximize the potential for enfilade or oblique fire and holding fire until the enemy is at relatively short range. The section relies on the Bren so heavily that revealing its position and attracting enemy attention by firing at long ranges is not a good idea. Historically this was achieved by using the Bren on single shot at distance where its accuracy rendered it useful, but the low deliberate rate of fire could easily be mistaken for a rifle. None of this means that you want to be relying on individual sections if you can help it though. One light machine gun and eight bolt action rifles do not translate into a significant amount of low level firepower. Given that the points value of units in the force selector reflects their combat power, it's clear that the Brits are behind the curve. The section weighs in at 37 points with regular experience and no modifiers, while the German equivalent, a Grenadier squad, costs 46, and an American rifle squad even more at 50. This lower level of firepower can make it difficult to build up that all-important fire superiority at the sharp end. So for anything larger than a single enemy team or machine gun nest, you really want to be bringing the whole platoon into play. This requires some classic tactical skills, forethought, positioning and concentration of strength against weakness. Two or three Bren guns are capable of putting out a significant amount of accurate suppressive fire and if spread out are difficult to suppress in return, while the 2 inch mortar can deal with point targets using high explosive or mask enemy positions with smoke, allowing maneuver elements to advance or blinding enemy fire support elements in the defence. So one of the interesting things about British rifle infantry is that you're encouraged to fight a level up. If the enemy has a team, send a section. If the enemy has a squad, send a platoon. This is common sense and something you really want to be dealing with any faction if you can, but the comparatively low firepower of British infantry does a lot to funnel you in that direction. Of course, it has some issues. The low ammunition capacity of the 2 inch mortar, for example, means that it's only good for one or two engagements max before needing resupply, and more significantly, if the enemy can hold up one of your platoons with a single squad by forcing it to stop, deploy and fight, then you're on the wrong side of the economy of force curve. This is where the second tactical effect of that anemic firepower comes into play. If the rifle company doesn't have the ability to operate effectively on its own, then the simple solution is to back it up. Attaching a tank or bringing 81mm mortars to bear or calling in 25 pounders are all ways to effectively boost the firepower of the company. In other words, the British infantry is not meant to work alone, it functions as part of a combined arms team. Attacking an enemy's strong points or repulsing an attack requires considerably more firepower than screening friendly armour or delaying the enemy long enough for mortar fire to take effect. So whenever possible, battlefield roles requiring heavy firepower should be offloaded onto more appropriate units which the infantry can enable and support without needing to act beyond its means. And this is something which is facilitated in scenarios by the fact that the Brits are usually fighting set-piece battles or in quick battles by the low cost of the infantry. In Battle for Normandy, for example, our British rifle company costs 506 points, while a German grenadier company costs 691. The 185 point difference can easily be made up by, for example, attaching a single Sherman or four 81mm mortar teams both options that increase the combat power of the Brits significantly. In a similar vein, the poor anti-tank potential of the rifle company, basically three piots and borderline suicide or close assaults with hand grenades, can be supplemented by six pounder AT guns in the defence and friendly armour in the attack. Again, like fighting a level up, you obviously want to be using combined arms with any faction, but our low firepower British infantry makes combined arms essential. As soon as we start looking at British rifle companies as parts of a larger machine, as the core or foundation to which other assets can be attached, they start making a lot more sense than they do as independent actors. And these two factors are what make the British rifle company so interesting to play. Sure, it struggles on its own, but learning how to use it, learning how to get the most out of that anemic firepower and how to integrate combined arms, means learning how to fight in combat mission. If you can succeed with British infantry, chances are you've picked up the tactical skill to do even better with the more self-contained American and German infantry companies. And that's all for this video. The Brits can take a lot of getting your head around in combat mission, 
Hopefully you found this useful and informative. I'll catch you in the next one.